Uh, the following interview was conducted with Professor Alexander King for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, December 11, 2007 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about your early years, parents and siblings growing up there. Okay. Um, I'm one of five kids. I was born and raised in London. Um, I guess archetypal baby boom kind of family. My parents met during the war. My father was from Scotland, Aberdeen. My mother from London. They met when my father was, I guess, defending London from the, uh, the German Air Force. Um, uh, I'm the fourth of five kids. I have uh, my oldest sibling is my brother, who still lives in London. Um, then came two sisters, then me, and then uh, the afterthought was my kid sister. Um, three of us live in the States now. Um, my oldest sister and my kid sister both live in Manhattan. Um, um, we were all raised together in a very small house in the suburbs of London. Okay. What was school like? Uh, how large was your school? Tell us about grade school going there. Ah, uh, well, we, um, we all went to a, a school that um, was literally a block away from home. Um, it's an interesting school. It's called Lonesome School. And I guess when it was built, it was literally lonesome. It was in the middle of a farm field. And like the rest of that part of England, it's you know, completely consumed in, in London now. Um, the uh, first few grades um, were in a wooden building, which is extremely unusual in England. Um, maybe there were 200 kids in school, and that went through um, age 11. So what's that, fifth grade, sixth grade? Um, at the end of that, I uh, won a scholarship to go to what in England is called a public school, what you would recognize as a prep school. Um, so I went as a day boy, uh, meaning I didn't board, I would commute every day to uh, a school called Dulwich College, um, which was 1,500 boys. It was all male at the time. Um, they required you to play rugby twice a week, which uh, I pretty soon figured out was uh, wet and cold and brutal <laughs> as an experience. I found ways out of doing that. Um, but it was a school that offered wonderful opportunities, both academically and uh, in terms of the extracurricular program. So I had a, a fantastic time for seven years there. And, um, Were there any clubs that you belonged to, in, in, as well as rugby, or just athletics? Well, uh, rugby was not a club. That okay. was a, a requirement. Um, For athletics, huh? Yeah. Um, but I found that you could avoid half of the rugby games um, if you developed what was called a minor sport. So I looked around for minor sports and discovered that fencing was something was done fully clothed and indoors and um, was quite pleasant to do during the winter. Right. So I became a uh, fencer. I uh, eventually, when I was at university, uh, on, on one occasion represented the United Kingdom with the EPE. So uh, um, that stood me in good stead for a while until I wore out a knee and had to have it uh, operated <laughs> on. But that, that that's OK. okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing I did there was um, I was part of uh, kind of a junior ROTC program they had in the Air Force section because I desperately wanted to learn to fly, which I eventually did. And then stopped immediately because I went to college and could no longer afford it. But um, it was fun while it lasted. Right. Did, you, did you get your, do you have your pilot's license? Did you learn how to I fly? I have not had a pilot's oh. license since I was 18 years old. <laughs> but I'd love to get it back. I mean, it's a matter of time. Right. Uh, and then you went on to tell us a little about going to college, where you went, and what college campus life was like. And okay. I went to uh, Sheffield University in the, arguably the Midlands or sort of borderline north of England. Um, it was a very straightforward red brick university, so-called red brick university, meaning not Oxford or Cambridge. Um, it, by those standards in those days, um, a moderate-sized English university, 6,000 students total. 
Um, now I believe it's up around 15 or 20,000 students there. Um, in the days when I went there, I think the numbers were something like 10% of the population college age went to university in England. Um, so it was a privilege. Um, the, the government paid for you to go. You didn't have to, you didn't, the students did not have to pay. Did not have to pay a cent. They never presented you with a bill. Well, except for the um, room and board. Sure. Um, and in fact, the government gave you money to go to college. You got a grant from actually your local government where you lived. Um, and I, I guess we didn't really realize it at the time, but it's an incredible privilege. Certainly. It really is. Did uh, you, and then you lived right on campus? Um, was there, was there residence it, halls? Interestingly, no. The, oh. uh, the number of residence halls was not quite large enough for the student body. So they arranged um, what they called digs, or uh, just basically had a room in the attic of someone's house that was rented out to me and another student. Um, so uh, we'd never met before. You know, it's like classic roommate situation. We became best of friends. I guess the alternative <laughs> is not worth thinking about. Um, and we still are. I mean, that's very nice. What were some of the activities? Because this is a little bit different going to a yeah. pretty school, much for the researchers. Right. Uh, share with us some of the activities or things okay. that went on. So in in English universities, you're admitted directly into a major. You don't come in undeclared and then have a chance to figure it out. You go to college about a year older than you do in the US. Um, undergraduate degrees are three years, so you finish up at about the same level, but you're already you predetermined. Um, so I, I went to college to study uh, what it, in England was called metallurgy, which here would be called metallurgy and Neither of them are called that at all anymore. It's all material science. Um, but uh, we didn't take general education credits. It was assumed that you knew how to read and that you read for yourself and you'd learn stuff along the way. Um, so I, I went to lectures in the mornings. I went to labs in the afternoons. And I did various other things in the evenings. Um, uh, I took part in the fencing team on campus, uh, and I went to a lot of discos and a lot of pubs. It was interesting, though. Is how large t uh, the town has grown, and the university, say, has grown the over the years? Yeah, the university's uh -huh. grown quite a bit over uh -huh. the years, and they've become more American in their outlook. I know I now get um, uh, phonathon calls all the way from the UK uh, asking for money, and... Uh, well, uh, you know, it's, it was a great school. Yeah, I, I had a great time for three years. Yeah, that's good. Then to graduate work, uh, what, 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 after you finished, when, when did you graduate, actually? I graduated in 75 mm -hmm. into a horrendous economic recession. So I did the classic thing, which is go to graduate school. Um, I got admitted to Oxford University. Um, and on the basis of a, a visit that I made... Um, hit it off very well with uh, somebody who wanted to be my advisor for my doctoral studies. They don't call them professors in England, or they weren't then. Um, so I thought this looked like a great opportunity. and Took advantage of it. Took advantage, went to Oxford, and started my uh, doctoral studies. Um, uh, again, it's different from US universities. Uh, graduate students in the UK do not have coursework commitments. Um, they basically come in, all you have to do is research. And um, I was given a project that actually demanded that I work in conjunction with a national lab because uh, I was doing radiation effects in metals. Um, the the project didn't go exactly the way we expected, but that's the nature of research. It sure. came, it produced a lot of interesting stuff, um, and I'd, I'd say graduate school was among the best days of my life. I mean, is that where in your family? Is that where you met your wife? No, I actually home? met my wife as an undergraduate at Sheffield uh, at a, uh, a dance on a, I guess a Friday or a Saturday night. Um, and we were married while I was in graduate school. 
Um, so uh, she helped um, <laughs> get me through that in all sure. sorts of ways. What was it like going to, living there at that time? I mean, was there activities, or were you pretty much involved with your with the research? Uh, um, you get pretty much involved in research. I did fence for the university still. Um, so I, I, I got what they call a blue because I fenced for Oxford against Cambridge, which is the only match that matters. Um, we lost. <laughs> um, but interestingly, that match is always conducted on neutral territory, so neither at Oxford or Cambridge. And they, uh, that year, fought in the gym of my old high school. So it was kind of an interesting... Small old, world. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Yeah. Fencing is a very small world anyway. Um, but yeah, be between fencing, research, and, and often working all night in the lab, because that's when um, the lab is quiet and you can get work done. Do they give stipends? Or is there any? What's the financial? Is there any financial support at all yeah, versus do, the you, U.S.? Right, oh. you you get a, a graduate stipend, um, and it lasts three years. And when it's done, it's done. So most PhDs in England last a little over three years because, as, as one of my professors said, hunger sharpens the brain. <laughs> okay. Then uh, tell us a little bit about your career path before you came to Purdue. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, I stayed on at Oxford briefly as a postdoc, uh, but um, I had an offer to come and work at MIT as a postdoc again, working with someone who really is the, the superstar in the, the subfield that I was working at the time. Um, so I thought that was an offer that was too good to pass up. Um, and I told my wife that it was a temporary job. We'd be going to the US for a year or maybe two. And she went along with that. And um, then after we'd been in the States for about a year, she began to realize that we were not going back. I mean, the, the opportunities um, in the U.S. were much better than they were in the U.K. And besides all that, the ice cream is much better, which made a big difference to, <laughs> to her at the time. So um, in the second year that I worked at MIT, I uh, started looking for a regular job and just applied to all of the faculty openings that were advertised. Um, eventually had a few offers and selected the one that paid the most, which was the State University of New York, Stony Brook, down on Long Island. Um, so we moved to Long Island in 1981. And uh, I started work as an assistant professor, doing all the things that assistant professors do, teaching class, writing proposals, writing papers, um, getting started with a few graduate students. I was very lucky. I had very good graduate students when I started out. Um, and you know, one thing leads to another. You, sure. you end up uh, getting the, the promotion and tenure to right. associate professor and, right. and upwards. In the midst of all that, um, I took a little bit of a side track and um, strayed into administration for a little while. Uh, I became dean of the graduate school at Stony Brook um, and did that for about four and a half years. I actually started out as associate dean, then the guy I reported to um, resigned, took his dream job, which was running a foundation. Um, so I was made acting dean and then dean of the graduate school, but altogether it was about four and a half years in that position. Um, and I learned a great deal uh, being an administrator, but then eventually went back to just being a professor, which is actually a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what's the size of the campus there, and what was that like as a contrast to, for I'm thinking of some of the questions I phrase, I think mm -hmm. of researchers who try to put it in a context, because it's different than living in Cambridge at the MIT. Uh, yes. Um, so MIT was wonderful because it's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You have all of Boston, which is a fabulous city. And as, as, for someone coming from England, it's a low level of culture shock. Um, Long Island is quite different. 
Um, it's full of Long Islanders, for one thing, which is a, a major deficit, perhaps. Um, but the, the campus is in a fairly rural area. There are a few people who commute from Stony Brook all the way to New York City every day. Um, but the campus is a large campus um, set aside. Uh, it's not in the town. It's just you it's have separate. to drive to it from wherever you come. Um, it's all, you know, 1,100 acres, I think, of, um, of Long Island grass and pine barren. It's about two miles from the beach, which causes a conflict sometimes during the summer. Uh, but the campus, about 22,000 students, uh, has a medical school, um, which is an interesting challenge if you're responsible for graduate students because um, medical school's a lot different than regular graduate school. Um, but it, it's a major research university in the state of New York, and the state of New York is a, um, a very strange place as far as higher uh, education is concerned. The state university system is the legacy of a Republican governor. And in the, the political system of New York, the, the, um, the Democrats are a little reluctant to support something which is clearly a Republican baby. And the Republicans are, are not always big on supporting higher education. So um, the state university sometimes feels like a bit of an orphan. Um, having said all that, it's, and it's very large. The state, the state university, university, university system, system is system huge. Is, right. Uh, um, it's, I think, about 45 or 48 campuses, ranging from full doctoral university centers all the way down to the smallest community colleges, all part of the state university mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And they try to run it as though it were one system, when really uh, there's a lot of... Right. different kinds of campuses. Where do the students come from that were at Stony Brook? Do they come from around there? Do they come from primarily New York State? Or what's the, the Okay, so the, the, the catchment area for Stony Brook is basically Long Island, New York City, downstate New York. So the first couple of counties north as you come out of New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and when we were there, uh, the campus used to empty out on Friday afternoon because you could get on the train actually on campus. There's a railway station on campus. You go all the way home to New York City or um, wherever you want to go. Um, so the campus was a little dead on the weekends. Um, it was especially dead a few years after we arrived um, when the legal drinking age went from 18 to 21 and they closed all the bars on campus. Um, so Interesting. Yeah. Uh, that changed the social dynamic I quite would imagine. a bit. I yeah. would imagine, right. Yeah. Oh. And you have family. Your, your children were born uh, there. Yeah, uh -huh. I have two sons, both of whom were born on Long Island, okay. uh, who have a little bit of trouble. Um, well, when they were small, they had a little trouble linguistically because they knew their parents were from England and spoke a little funny. Um, <laughs> What they didn't realize immediately is that I'm from London and speak differently from my wife, who is from Lincoln in the north of England. Um, so they were often confused about whether a word was being pronounced like an American or, <laughs> a little bit or, or exactly what it was. But it, it, sometimes there was confusion <laughs> going on there. Uh, uh, did you go to the beach a lot then? And, and Tony, did, you, did you live close to the campus there? Or? We lived close to the campus, yeah, uh -huh. about a mile north of campus and about a mile south of the beach. So um, that made it nice. It's very nice. I mean, sometimes you come home and just take the dog to the beach for a walk, you know, sure. throw a ball around, throw stones in the water or whatever. And you could do that any time. Uh, very, nice very environs, nice little cultural thing, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, very, very good. pleasant. Okay, now we'll move on to you came to Purdue then in um, 1999. And 99, how, did, yeah. how did that come about? Um, that sort of harkens back all the way to the postdoc days at MIT when you, know, you get to know a lot of people in different places. Um, 
and in about 1998 or 97, Purdue started to think about looking for a new head for the materials um, department. Uh, one of the faculty members at Purdue then had been a graduate student when I was a postdoc and thought I might be a good person. So they started to invite me over here to um, give colloquium and then eventually asked me if I'd be interested in applying for the job of head of the school. So um, actually, it took me a long time to get my resume together and submit it, but they kept hounding me for the resume, so I eventually sent it in. Um, was invited for a formal interview and then a follow-up interview and then another follow-up. And the long and the short of it was that uh, Dick Schwartz, who was then the Dean of Engineering, offered me the job and um, he sounded more honest than most deans I've met, so uh, I thought that it was probably a good opportunity. Um, and I accepted uh, and uh, then started to deal with the issue of uh, organizing the, my wife and the kids to come and move, which um, it was an interesting challenge, I guess. I yeah. imagine. But it all worked out. It, yeah, sure. it worked out fine. How old were the children when you came then? I'm um, trying to think. Uh, they were probably aged 10 and 14. Okay. Maybe 11 and 15. Uh, the exact numbers. I'd have to, I'd have to do the math it, now. That's okay. Um, but but it, sometimes it's easier than, say, high school or. Well, that's college. right. It was uh, The choice was either do it then or not do it until both were finished high school. Sure, right. So we, we didn't want to dis disturb high school. So they were both a little upset moving away from all their friends and so on. But um, my older son, Ben, got over it moderately quickly when he discovered that you could learn to drive a car a year younger in Indiana than you could in New York. <laughs> um, that really made things a whole lot better, I think. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's that little, you know, whatever. Yeah. Makes it a little bit easier. Sure. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the school. Your definition of materials engineering. Uh, you know, I, I've written magazine articles about the fact that it's impossible to define. <laughs> so, um, do I have a definition? Mm. Or some comment. I can I explain what it is we do. That's okay. I'm thinking of, you know, people are researching the university and this will be one of the schools that they're looking at. And mm -hmm. as I said earlier, that's how sometimes the questions sort of focus in. So any comment would be, you know, sure. helpful to it. To them. Okay. Well, um, the subject is called materials science and engineering in most universities now. That's a uh, title that first came up at Northwestern University in about 1965, I think, but everybody's gradually adopting it. Uh, Purdue is still called the School of Materials Engineering. Um, and there's a historical, um, well, there's a piece of folklore about why that is. Uh, the, the, the given reason is that engineering is a very powerful academic unit at Purdue um, and was perceived to control a very large slice of the university. So when it came time to change the name from the School of Metallurgical Engineering to something a bit more modern, a uh, request was crafted to change the name to Material Science and Engineering. And the Dean of Science at the time is reputed to have said, if any material science is going to be done, it's going to be done in the College of Science, not in the School of Engineering. So they dropped science and left the department in engineering. In reality, um, the study of materials is kind of at the interface between science and engineering. Um, I've described it as the conduit by mm -hmm. which science enters engineering sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do is we use basic scientific principles um, to create materials that have properties that are useful to engineers. So it sort of sits there at the interface. In England, by comparison, um, there is usually at any university a, a college of applied science, which is distinct from pure science or engineering. 
and material sits in the College of Applied Science. So mm -hmm. it's a matter of where you put it. Uh, right. Pigeonholing doesn't really work very well for us. Sure, I understand. So that why the emphasis on material science in the College of Engineering rather than science, I think you've addressed, mm -hmm. made a comment on that. Okay. How about teaching? Some of your um, uh, styles or challenges and uh, uh, tips well, and comments on that? Yeah. The big challenge for me is having enough time. Um, so you've got, you've got quite a few classes that you've been teaching, and I should say also <laughs> that your website is very good, very helpful. Thank you. Very good. I haven't looked at it for ages. <laughs> Thanks. Very good. Very um, we, so I, I have not actually taught undergraduate classes, at least not consistently mm -hmm. or not a full class while I've been at Purdue. Um, I have, in every semester I've been here, taught um, graduate students how to operate electron microscopes, which is the, the main tool of my research. Mm -hmm. um, I do that because it's necessary for them to learn for their research, and also because it generates uh, users for our instruments, and then the users pay small amount, actually not that small, um, but their research grants pay to use the microscopes, and that helps us keep up the instruments. So I do sure. that. Um, so when I teach, it's uh, some in the classroom um, and a lot in the lab. So there's a lot of uh, intense hands-on laboratory work. In the classroom, I am incredibly old-fashioned. I use chalk and a blackboard, um, despite the fact that I'm teaching you know, nanotechnology, quantum mechanics, and you name it. Um, because I've taught the material arguably too much, I tend not to work from notes. I walk into the classroom, pick up the chalk, and go for, just it. Go for it and start talking, and uh, usually gets out without being too badly garbled. But I, I do encourage um, class participation. I don't like it when the students just sit there and take notes. I, I try and force them to be involved. Um, I have all sorts of odd techniques for doing that, um, some of which have uh, become notorious, at least from Stony Brook days, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, the students tend to get used to it after a while. They get used to the idea that they're going to have to do the thinking in the class. Um, the worst classes for me are the ones that start at 1.30 because the students have had lunch and they're feeling a bit... Um, uh, it's a bit more soporific for them. Mm. They, they want something nice and gentle at that point. I'm not a, I'm not a gentle teacher. <laughs> Good. So the students, uh, your interaction with them over time, uh, have that changed or any comment? Have you noticed a focus has changed or the students? Yeah, yeah. students have changed a lot. Okay. Um, From, say, before in, them coming here? Or? Well, the, the students at Stony Brook are definitely definitely different from the students at Purdue. Um, I, you know, one of the things that I think um, Purdue really needs to capitalize on, and has started to do so a little bit, is the very special nature of Purdue's students. Um, and it's an interesting set of questions that come up. I mean, it, uh, you could put me in a, in a room, you know, a cocktail party, and tell me everybody in this room either graduated from MIT, Stony Brook, or Purdue. And I wouldn't have to ask any direct questions, but I'm pretty sure I could sort them out into three corners of the room pretty quickly. Um, and it's very hard to explain how that would work, but, uh, or, you know, or encapsulate what is so special about Purdue students. But as one part of it is what makes us the cradle of astronauts the way we are. Um, the, the, the best way I can describe it is if you, if you buy a new piece of equipment for the lab, it arrives in a crate and you sort of, everybody's excited and they want to play with the new toy. Um, the MIT student will just tear the crate off throw the manual in the back corner of the room and try and figure out how the thing works, put it together the best they can, and then start playing with it and see what they can make it do. The Purdue student will very carefully open the crate, find the manual, and just stop and read the thing. 
Uh, and when they've read it from cover to cover, they will know exactly what they're going to do. Then they'll undo the whole of the rest of the crate, put the thing together the way it was supposed to be put together, check it out the way it was supposed to be checked out, and then start using it more creatively. Um, it's a you know, it's a very different approach to life. There's uh, you know there's a sense of there's a right way to do things, and that's what we start with at Purdue, and I think that's what makes for great astronauts. But they they also are able, when the right way doesn't work anymore, to improvise. Right. The, the, the MIT students improvising from the get go. Um, Sometimes that's okay, and sometimes you can get in trouble. <laughs> Very good comments. That's good. Um, strategic plan. You've worked on that, and that yeah, that I've took worked a lot on of time. everybody else did in all the schools, and it's yeah. now you're leaving. We're starting. It will start another another phase on that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm leaving as the next strategic plan gets underway, but I'm going to have to create one for where I go. So it's okay. uh, I'm not exactly it's always escaping. with you, right? <laughs> yeah, strategic planning is never going to go away. No. It's, you know, it's diversity in in the schools. Uh, uh, any comment on that? Yeah, I think um, I think if there's any area in which I'm disappointed at Purdue, it's diversity. I mean, Stony Brook diversity was kind of it just came naturally. I was actually involved in some major diversity initiatives as the graduate dean mm -hmm. trying to raise the profile of, of students of color and so on in, in the graduate programs there. And we did very well. We went from 5% representation to 15% um, yeah. of black, Hispanic, and American Indian um, students. At Purdue, all the time I've been here, it's been more or less static. Uh, there's been no major shift in the population. I think we're beginning to see a slight uptick in mm -hmm. the number of um, Hispanic students. Um, and the number of women students in engineering sort of went down for a while and is recovering a little bit. Um, but there's been no major changes in the diversity. Um, within materials engineering, we've traditionally been a little bit more gender diverse than most of the schools of engineering and that comes about because we're a smaller school which I think makes it more comfortable. Um, we've, we have a, a richer faculty to student ratio meaning everybody knows everybody, faculty, sure. students alike. Um, and our subject matter lead, lends itself to some things that are I guess more socially um, interesting to women students. Um, since the biomedical engineering program has started up, a lot of the women have gone there and we've seen a, a small decline in the number of women students. Mm -hmm. um, our best year we graduated a class of 48 percent women and we're now typically in the 25 to 30 percent women. Mm -hmm. I would really like to see us at 50%, that's, the, sure. that's where we should be. Right. And in terms of um, uh, ethnicity, I'd really like to see us doing much better than we are. Um, I think, you know, Purdue tries very hard, but often misses the point uh, in some of the things it does. Um, it's, it's sort of interesting to me that things like the Black Cultural Center, as wonderful as it is, is far away from the center of campus. Um, the equivalent organization at Stony Brook and other campuses where I've been right in the center That's of the, the campus. Center. You mm -hmm. can't miss um, the Black Cultural Center or its equivalent. Um, you know, uh, we do things, but they're, they're not quite where they need to be here at Purdue. Yeah, I see. Um, the campaign for Purdue, that was... The campaign for Purdue was yeah. fabulous. Right. <laughs> uh, I did so well out of that. Um, it's. I can tell by your face you look like Santa. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. It, it's. It was great. Um, uh, I, I've been incredibly lucky. You know, I came here in '99. Martin Jischke came a year later. Uh, we got a new dean, Linda Katehi, around the same time. Um, 
the strategic plan uh, was a very uh, comprehensive strategic plan. And I think uh, Martin Jischke in particular really understood what a strategic plan is for, what it should look like, what it needs to do, and how you use it to raise money. Um, so we created a, a strategic plan of our own in materials engineering. It addressed slightly different issues. Um, so the campus plan looked at things like the faculty to student ratio and the um, campus infrastructure. What we were looking at in materials engineering is um, how we compared with other schools of material science and engineering around the country. And it was uh, very clear that we were smaller than the very successful schools. Size really counts uh, in a subject like materials engineering. Um, we were then 11 faculty, and the average uh, for all schools in North America at that point was about 16. Um, and we had a relatively poor faculty to student ratio compared to the, the peer course. group. Um, so you know that was one major part of the strategic plan was to address that. Uh, Martin Jischke's plan brought a large number of faculty lines, and I was able, with Linda Katehi's help and concurrence, and with the cluster hiring program that um, that engineering put into place, uh, I was able to do very well. We now have 23 faculty, um, very good. which is absolutely magnificent. No other school of materials engineering in the country has doubled in the last six, seven years like we have. Very nice. Yeah. That's very good. But I th I'd say, you know, we're on the map in a way that we never were before. Yeah. That's very nice to hear. And you should be pleased. I'm extremely yeah. pleased. I'm, um, actually, I'm really, I'm, I'm delighted with it from, you know, just from my own internal yardstick. You should be. Um, but I'm even more gratified when I have visitors from outside. So. Um, one of my old professors from Oxford came by last semester, and I took him out to dinner at Bistro 501 after after he gave a colloquium, and he sure. met with a lot of people in the department. And he said, "You know, uh, said I I never realized what a world class institution you have here." And just last Friday, a colleague from MIT came by. Um, who had been here prior to my coming and uh, was also extraordinarily complimentary. Um, and those things make me feel really right. good. They should. Yeah. More, well and justified. That's very nice. Next thing up, tell us a little about that Jefferson Science Fellows Program. Oh yeah, that, yeah. that was uh, and that was a crazy <laughs> kind of a year. Um, this was a program created the year before. I, I, I'm one of the second class of um, Jefferson Science Fellows. It was created um, because of a report produced by the National Academy of Science that uh, it was actually at the request of Madeleine Albright. Mm. Um, when she was Secretary when of State. When she was Secretary of State. Uh, and the question she posed to the National Academies was, um, what roles should science have in diplomacy and foreign policy? And what do we need to do in order to enable those things? And the, her concern was that the number of scientists working for the State Department had been cut um, for a number of strategic uh, budget balancing type of reasons. Um, science had taken very much a back seat. So the, the National Academies came forth with a report that suggested a number of different um, programs, among which was this create this Jefferson Science Fellows program, where um, supposedly distinguished, certainly tenured professors from universities would come and spend a year at the State Department and then have a kind of consulting arrangement for five years following. Um, well, the, when the program was announced, I saw the first year flyer and I looked at it and I said, that looks really 
interesting. I've always loved to travel. I've been around the world, um, lectured on five continents. I've missed Antarctica. Um, so, you know, I, I enjoy those things. I, um, I had been president of the Materials Research Society. I'd helped create um, partner societies in Africa and in Brazil. So I, I, I liked the, the, the international arena. I felt there was a lot that science could do, and I looked at this thing, and I said, that's really interesting. But here I am, I'm in the middle of hiring like crazy. Um, I'm head of a school at Purdue, which is a really full-time occupation. And so I sort of let that one go by. And then the next year, the flyer came out, and the dean's office uh, noticed it, and they were trying to drum up some nominations. And so the um, Claude Cocchini, the associate dean, called me up, and I think he called all the heads. He said, uh, have you seen this Jefferson Science Fellows fly? I said, yeah, sure. It looks kind of interesting. He said, do you think there's anybody in your department who might be a good candidate? And I said, well, honestly, Claude, I can't think of anybody, but it's something I'd really like to do one day. And um, one day turned out to be that year, and Claude put together a nomination. Uh, I guess nominally Sally Frost Mason um, submitted it on behalf of the university. Um, then anyway, I, I had to supply a Vita, a couple of essays, and some names of uh, referees, which I did. I didn't think it had very much of a chance. Then I got a call saying, you know, can you come to Washington for, uh, you know, the next stage of the interview? And they gave a date, which happened to be a day on which I had just scheduled a student's PhD defense. And I'll do a lot of cruel things to graduate students, but messing around with a defense day is something you want to avoid if you can. So I said, well, you know, I can't make it that day. Could we reschedule maybe the day before, maybe the day after? And they said, well, you know, you, do, you don't understand. We're bringing in a dozen people to be interviewed and 20 people to do the interviewing. The 20 people include the presidents of several major societies, uh, the directors of several foundations, a f handful of Nobel Prize winners, and a bunch of people from the State Department. And we're not going to reschedule those people. You either come today. Oh, dear. Or, yeah. So, I, I eventually got them to agree that I could do this as a video conference. So I ended up um, in a video conference facility in Knoi um, doing three one-hour interviews back-to-back -back where other people were sort of rotating through sure. actually on-site. Um, Interesting. And I guess I look good on camera. That's the only thing I could say because they <laughs> offered me um, the fellowship. And uh, so I went to Linda Katehi and I said, well, you know, they've offered me this fellowship. Do you want me to step down from being the head so I can take it? And she said, no, you will remain head and you will take the fellowship. And so she made it impossible for me to refuse. Um, so I went off to Washington for a year and... How many were in the group? Were you, were you five. One? Five. There I are see. five they of pick, us. They pick five and mm -hmm. it's a... You say it's one year, and then you're on call for a couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you come into Washington, and you, you spend a, a few weeks deciding where you're going to work. And you, you tour the State Department, um, looking at different bureaus and offices, and decide where you're going to work at. Um, I eventually persuaded the Bureau of African Affairs that they would do well to have somebody thinking about science with them for a year. So they, they took me in. Uh, they found me a little cubicle in a, an economic policy office. And they said, there, you're the senior science advisor for the Bureau of African Affairs. Uh, I'm the only science advisor for the Bureau of African Affairs. There's 300 people in Washington. There's 48 embassies all over Africa. I'm the only scientist. Um, if science breaks out in Africa, then somebody reports it to me, and I have to do something about it. Um, and it, uh, it proved to be a really interesting year. I mean, I, I learned an immense about, um, amount about the way the State Department works 
about the way the federal government works, about the way different agencies work. Um, but there were a few occasions where I actually was able to do things. You know, I, you know, I had an office with a telephone and two computers. <laughs> it was just, you know, that's my entire um, facility. But basically what you do is you communicate and you pick up the phone, you talk to people, you send emails out to people and you try and persuade them to do things. The, um, the thing that took most of my time um, and was probably the biggest thing I did or among many is that avian influenza um, was a big, big issue uh, during the year I was there. It actually arrived in Africa during the February of the, um, the academic year that I was there. And they, you know, the State Department looked at this thing and they said, well, it's a virus, right? I said, yeah, I said, it's a virus. They said, okay, that's science. That means it belongs to you. Um, so uh, in a long and roundabout way, I came to be uh, the U.S. government's lead coordinator for avian influenza in Africa. Um, chairing or co-chairing a, a panel, what they call an interagency working group. Um, so we had a, a group of people, including the military, um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Centers for Disease Control, Therefore Health and Human Services, um, USAID, the Agency for International Development, State Department, obviously, us, and a whole bunch of others. Um, trying to prevent the spread of avian influenza in Africa. And I'd say, I think we did a pretty effective job, mm -hmm. actually. It broke out in Nigeria. It spread occasionally into neighboring countries, but uh, by providing the necessary education programs, a certain amount of experts on the ground, uh, a certain amount of equipment, we actually managed to get it contained almost every time. It's, it's actually spreading a little bit more now. Um, but we, I, I'd well. say we slowed it and contained it pretty yeah. well, uh, considering we didn't know really what we were doing at first. Um, and the challenges we had, you know, no lab facilities, no well-trained doctors, um, issues of uh, incentives and counter-incentives. When a farmer's flock starts to show signs of avian influenza, in Africa, the first instinct is get the flock to market um, sure. and the government doesn't necessarily have the means to compensate a farmer for um, for the loss of a flock so uh, there were a, lots of challenges uh, in lots that. of interesting challenges right. did you do much traveling while you were I actually did not I had my suitcases packed a couple of times um, but didn't get to travel I you know, I'd been to Africa once before I really wanted to go to Africa and I guess I still could. There's still uh, the, the opportunity to do that. Yeah, um, sounds good. Okay. Um, then uh, that new um, the materials consortium is that still going on? Matcon, no. That was uh, started in '96. Before started UK. before I arrived. It mm -hmm. was actually an offshoot of um, another large project called MISCON, the Midwest Superconductivity oh, okay. Consortium. Right which Arden Pement uh, had um, organized. I remember, remember that, yeah. Yeah, and um, MISCON created MATCON as a kind of a Purdue-funded operation. I inherited MATCON from Arden when he left, and um, eventually it, uh, it outlived its usefulness, and, and we gently, quietly closed moved, it down. And we moved on, right? Yeah, we moved <laughs> on. We, we now have other things that replace sure. it. One of the things that new uh, G-A-A-N-N, that new, that mm -hmm. comment on that, that's recent. Yeah, GAN right. is a uh, U.S. Department of Education program. It stands for Graduate Assistantships in Areas of mm -hmm. National Need. And it's a program that sort of predates the America Competes Act by a long way. Mm -hmm. with the idea of um, fostering high-level study in areas, like it says, of national need. And actually, uh, we've had three successive rounds of support 
from the GAN program. It provides graduate fellowships for U.S. national students who want to study materials. Um, Professor Elliot Slamovich wrote the first proposal for us, um, wrote the second one, recently wrote the third one, and that's been very helpful in building up our graduate program. Mm -hmm. Is it just for the material, just for your school, you got it? Uh, it's situation? available in different areas. Oh, okay. Um, the, the Department of Education each year declares which areas it will uh, support Perfect. the program. Um, we've had it now for, I think, nine years. Oh, that's very good. So, yeah, it's been good. a very good program for right. us. Got a Purdue, since you've been here, any Purdue tradition that kind of sticks in your mind? Or that <laughs> you have one that uh, you like to comment yeah. on? Let's see, Purdue tradition. I, I'm, there's a lot of things I, um, I love about Purdue. Uh, when I came to Purdue, you have to realize, I, you know, there were a lot of things I didn't get. Um, <laughs> I'd never been at a university where they played football in a, any serious manner. Stony Brook, no football. Well, they, they had they had kind of club level oh. football, but nobody paid attention. They've they've since gone um, into Division One, um, but uh, that was after I left. And you know, I came here. They had this thing called a stadium, which uh, was kind of a shock, um, <laughs> and a marching band, which was a, a bigger shock. And I, I just love the whole thing. Um, I had to get an alum um, to take me to a football game and explain what was going on. Uh, in all aspects, I had to explain the whole set of rules of the game. I didn't have a clue at first, and yeah, I'm pretty good now, I guess. Uh, going to the Rose Bowl was a fabulous I bet. experience. Right. Um, there's a number of traditions. Yeah, I, I, I love the, I guess, the Purdue Christmas show. PMO um, is fabulous. You, uh, you know, I used to go to shows on Broadway where they weren't as professional as um, what PMO does. Right. Um, so, you know, the Glee Club, the Paduettes, all, oh. all of it, fabulous. Um, the thing, I guess the one thing that still actually brings a lump to my throat. It's the strangest thing. Um, and it, it was at the very first football game I went to. They did this thing at the beginning of the game where they they raise the flag and someone recites this. The I am an American. I am an American. Um, I am a naturalized American. And uh, coming from where I come from, my um, my you, my parents come from a generation, and their parents particularly come from a generation and come from parts of Europe where um, patriotism is sometimes or has in the past been abused and used as an excuse for things you don't want to think about and um, you know, the last refuge of a scoundrel and all that stuff. But the um, I am an American. Um, piece uh, strikes me as being the most appropriate uh, expression of patriotism that I've come across. And because I chose to be an American, you know, um, saying it gratefully, yeah, I'm an American. Yeah. It means a lot. That's right. That's nice. Do you have a favorite memory of Purdue? Um, boo. <laughs> or either that or how about an outstanding uh, event? And either um, of those. Well, try to summarize with that. Gee, uh, I have a lot of favorite memories. Um, and it's going to be really actually hard to leave Purdue. I think, um, so, yeah, ah, gee. The Rose Bowl was a great sure, event. Right. I mean, the you whole addressed some of them in the traditions, but right, the, which is good. Um, I think my favorite memory of all time um, came actually while I was away in Washington and there are a lot of things that came up while I was in Washington you go places and people would say oh you're from Purdue and uh, you, you never quite realize how much that means in different places but the, the, thing, the thing that floored me um, was the students back here 
I, I had, to had a, a little bit of a struggle during the summer before I went uh, over a scholarship program that um, wasn't working properly, but eventually uh, spent a lot of time on it and got it squared away. Figured out squared away. And a lot of students got um, some scholarship support that year. Um, and so I, I uh, had some troubles with the administration, had uh, you know, some loss of sleep and stuff. Um, but about midway through October, I think, I was living alone in this little, very nice apartment in Washington and wasn't getting much mail because I deliberately kept my home address. And I went down, opened up the mailbox, and there's this very big, fat envelope, and it was full of thank you cards from my students. Just floored me. That's wonderful. That really, that's that's marvelous, and that really sticks with you, and it means mm -hmm. a lot. Yes. Uh, any questions that uh, were not asked, or any closing comments that you'd like to share? Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't know. Um, when I came here, I you know I said I didn't understand football. I didn't understand the loyalty of the alums. Um, I think I figured that out. Um, Purdue's a hard place to leave. Yes. Very hard place to leave. Yes. But you're moving, tell, let me tell the researchers you're moving on, just uh, we'll get it on the tape, where you're going to be going next. Yeah, I'm going to be the director of the Ames Laboratory, which is a DOE facility in Ames, Iowa. Uh, it's a lab um, that focuses on materials, so I guess I'm reasonably qualified to take that on. It's about 600 people who work there, so it's a, a significant facility. It was created in the Second World War, part of the Manhattan Project. It uh, started out by purifying the uranium for the um, Manhattan Project, and has since built on um, the expertise in purifying metals, uh, and then using the metals that it purified to generate uh, new and intriguing materials. So I think it makes some of the most interesting materials on the planet right now. Sounds good. You're looking forward to it then. Yeah, yes. I am. Oh. I want to thank you, Dr. King, for this very thank nice you. interview. And I, we want to wish you the best of luck. I know you'll keep in touch. Uh, I can't avoid it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay.